the digitalization of, of Latin America uh, has gotten to uh, a critical point or mass critical point where uh, almost uh, any business would thrive uh, locally for sure like I can guarantee that <laughs> Eddie Arrieta, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm doing great, Michael. Thank you so much for the invitation. Of course. So you're in Colombia right now, right? I'm in, I'm in Colombia in a small town called Cincelejo. Most people wouldn't even know where it is, but if you are familiar with Colombia, Cartagena, it's, it's pretty popular these days. So we're probably like three hours away in the north coast of Colombia, that would be. Amazing. Well, I'm, once this whole pandemic is over, I'm excited to travel, meet you in person over there, awesome. uh, see see what's happening in Colombia. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned to me earlier is that Colombia is one of the is, is a big tech hub of innovation. There's a lot of innovation happening around the area. Uh, you yourself are, are a serial, serial entrepreneur, uh, been involved with many companies. You've started your own uh, your own organizations that have grown tremendously, and I'm excited to hear about them. But I want before all that you to take me back to you writing a book on the history of international tourism. What the hell is that about? <laughs> that's, that's super interesting. I, I think one of my first um, uh, ventures or, or, or ideas that came out of you know me trying to do entrepreneurship was that I really, really enjoyed uh, tourism and that I enjoyed particularly ecotourism where you would try to have the least impact possible in, in the region where you are working at. Uh, and along that process, what I realized is that I wanted to promote some of the tourism that I knew uh, around around the world because I had the opportunity to travel. This is around like 10 years ago. And uh, when I'm doing this process, I, of course, knew that I knew very little about tourism. <laughs> I thought right. I knew. And most people would think, oh, I know a lot about tourism. It's like, no, you don't. Nothing. Um, <laughs> and I ended up getting a scholarship in, in a university in Colombia uh, to do uh, my master's degree in international business. Uh, wow. But I didn't want to do this thesis that you do and like all the normal work that people do. So I was like, can I do something different, like something that I'm more more likely to finish? Uh, <laughs> and uh, the book came to be an option. And I thought, oh, that's an amazing option because then I can learn about all different types of like tourism and what is happening. Exactly. And not. Uh, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's really funny that you ask about it because I never published it. <laughs> and my, one, of, one of my teachers, she's um, like a postdoctorate, like she's actually really good at this sort of thing. She's like, you need to publish this book. And just because the pandemic was hitting, it was one of the things that really came back to me. It's like, well, a lot of people are like, oh, I should write a book. I'm like, I wrote one. I just need to publish it now. <laughs> So where, where is it? Where, when can I buy it? When can I get it and read it? Uh, I think I have, um, and, and it's very good that you all also ask this question because I just finished kind of like planning uh, the upcoming quarters and years uh, to come. Not years to come, but like if I'm lucky <laughs> to get to the next three years. And one of the things that I put down was that I need to publish uh, a specific number of books. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to do this one. There is a low-hanging fruit here for 2021. Exactly. And my main objective in the next uh, two quarters is to first update whatever was in the book because things have changed in the past like 10 years um, and because of the pandemic it just become much more relevant so I was like I, exactly. I think it's the perfect timing for me to like get this book out and then get some momentum towards my goal for the next uh, five years and obviously international tourism in 2021 is going to be I think one of the most interesting things to research because you have you know a world that is becoming more globalized people love traveling and exploring new people and ideas and all of a sudden that comes to a halt we all go to inside and now there's hopefully going to be a resurgence of this so I'm excited to read it just please let me know when it's out but Eddie and now I'd love to hear about your entrepreneurial journey because besides from from writing history books you're also an entrepreneur yourself you run a few organizations you help other entrepreneurs and founders create create and run their businesses so give me a little bit of a round down and this time go back all the way to you selling chocolate what was that about <laughs> awesome so I, I think I think I realized I was uh, or I had entrepreneurial tendencies I, I realized I had entrepreneurial tendencies when I was maybe six years old uh, because I would I would take like my toys and and then I would sell them 
to buy my friends' toys in like uh, like in kindergarten and, and like primary school. So it would take a, like the, I remember like buying with my like saving my allowance to be able to buy a toy to then resell that toy like very very early age. And then as I became older, I I and I would call this like the basic like commerce like basic entrepreneurship that you can do mm -hmm. which is like i buy something cheaper sell it more expensive like there is not much more to it you add maybe some value in some way and, and that's when i when i started doing some things and chocolate just became a thing in high school because you were first of all not allowed to sell chocolates in high school uh because uh, there, there was a monopoly on the business which was wow. the school cafeteria so <laughs> <laughs> that, you, we had to take down the big guy um, and, and I was selling, cho I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take books to school. I would uh, sell chocolate, but my, uh, my differentiating component was that I gave credit. Uh, the kids that were selling other type, types of, uh, uh, of candy were not giving credit and I was giving a lot of credit with chocolate. And at some point, um, you know, the legal system came upon us and the company was dismantled <laughs> in, in mere days, <laughs> it disappeared. Uh, but it allowed me to, to, to uh, prove a lot of things. Uh, I bought a lot of like soccer gear. I remember buying like guitar strings. And like back then, like I, I come from, from a humble background and it was very difficult to like get money and for wow. me to have money. Uh, became a thing. So money was kind of like the driver in those early days. So you found a product, you got product market fit, you managed to sell to people, uh, you managed to be successful at it, successful enough that you had the big guys coming and shutting you down. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, during high school, you already experienced uh, pretty much the lifetime of, of most startups. Uh, so, so what happens later? How do you continue on your entrepreneurial journey? I, I would say it, it's... Um, it's become or it's been a discovery process uh, along the way um, because I didn't know these terms. I didn't know what entrepreneurship meant. In fact, uh, you know, my, my, my first goal uh, when I was a teenager, like doing this, these businesses and not, I, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to study biochemistry. I wanted to anything to do. In fact, I, I was gonna I was gonna pursue a degree in biochemistry. And most of my family they are doctors in uh, chemical engineering, in mechanical engineering, uh, or doctors in, in in law or different things. So they, they mostly pursue academics. Uh, and for me, it, it just it, it seemed at some point that it didn't fit. And right. I went to college, but I, I changed like last minute. I didn't do biochemistry. I went for international business and I went for international business because it seemed kind of like the most generic thing that would not take me in any specific path. And along that process, uh, when I was doing international business and, and a little bit of economics, um, I get very involved in social entrepreneurship. There are different projects going on around the school in my hometown in Cincelejo. Because you know, if you're studying internationally and you come from a small town, it becomes very important that, that you kind of like bring back some of the things that you're learning. And then right. I start realizing that some of my friends have so, some of those tendencies. So what we st start doing is projects that would uh, be sustainable over time uh, to allow uh, vulnerable communities to, to gain benefits out of whatever it is that we were doing. And specifically, what we tried in, in, in most of the cases was to teach something to, to kids or, or more privileged kids of a town. Let's say New Delhi would be New Delhi teaching English or would be New Delhi doing certain activities that would generate or give us money so that we could give them scholarships to kids from poorer areas uh, that could go and do something else. And this is teenagers do, doing this. And, wow. and it's no excuse, of course, teenagers today are, are much more advanced than we, went back, we were back then. We're talking 2006. So uh, wow. 2006, like there was no, there was no like like smartphones that like internet was seldom used, uh, and and it was very difficult for us at the time to communicate different things. But we were we went to these towns and we did these projects. After that, I decided to come back to Colombia um, because I'm very romantic about those things. I believe that I'm very well positioned to generate impact. Uh, in my hometown specifically, and I always dream of coming back to my hometown, which is a later story, but uh, when I come back to Colombia, I visit Bogota and then I visit Medellin. My sisters are living in Medellin. And then I start uh, working in whatever it is I could find until I could find different things that I could wow. uh, actually pursue as an entrepreneur. The first thing that I pursued as an entrepreneur was tourism. So because of that, I, I, I connect with the university and I start doing my master's in international business with a focus on tourism. And we uh, co-found something called Tucaribe, which is an operador 
the operator basically what it does is that it creates touristic packages and then it's sold to, to bigger places uh, but this is once again like basic uh, kind of like commerce like we create a product and then we sell it but i remember back then and this we're talking 2010 um nobody was doing seo <laughs> back then nobody nobody tried to do that and we started doing some articles to kind of like pursue and i remember that back then you had like black hat and white hat seo and then what i decided was like we have to be white hat we have to add value and this whole silicon valley mentality that today comes kind of like sounds cliche but it definitely like Changed the way in which many entrepreneurs did business uh, ten years ago, and um, maybe maybe more than today. But but in that process, then I find who became at that point in 2012, uh, 14, my first kind of like official partner uh, in a venture called Publicize. Uh, actually, the first right. venture was Espacio, which Espacio was a co-working space in the city of Medellin. Back then, there was n there were no co-working spaces, and I remember uh, my, my partner asking me like, uh, "Where can we go to a co-working space in Medellin?" And I was like, I don't know what a co-working space is. And then wow. he explains it to me, and I'm like, this needs to like, exist. <laughs> like, why are you? Like, who was the who is the genius that did this? <laughs> and then he's thinking of starting a co-working space. And then that's the first venture that we start together. And then the second one is Publicize. And Publicize uh, exists because of a need in the startup world where you have to get visibility for your startup. You always need to get visibility for your startup. Right. But the system is not creative for that, really. Uh, the system is creative for large companies to get visibility because of right. you know, the markups and et cetera, et cetera. So Publicis became uh, one of the first companies or agencies in the world to work directly with startups. And uh, what did the, what, what this did uh, in, in you know, the, the seven or so years working uh, uh, with startups was that it got me really involved with a lot of different business models, a lot of different stop startup communities, a lot of different different places where there was no technology and then it, it exploded. I remember, uh, and I can give you f uh, some examples, uh, Medellin is one of those cases where mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago there was pretty much nothing. And today you have an organization called Ruta N that is devoted to attracting uh, innovation and talent to the city to create startups. And I remember what happened in those 10 years? Because 10 years is nothing. It's nothing in the scope, obviously, of history of mankind. But but even in the scope of, you know, technology, it's it's you know, it, it seems like nothing. But but so much has happened in the pa past years. I'm, I'm still thinking I'm still reflecting on what you said that 10 years ago, people weren't doing SEO. You know, I grow up, uh, you know, in generation X or Y or whatever it is. And to me, like if you don't have good SEO, you're nothing, you know, on the online world. So, so it, it, it's unbelievable to me. But what happened in these ten years that that the Columbia uh, Innovation Hub really took off? I think I think what happened is um, th there was a generational change. If if you think about it, ten years ago, uh, a lot of the fifteen year olds are getting exposed uh, to technology right. or getting exposed to different business models like very early in their lives like if i was to think like when i was 15 years old being exposed to the idea that a facebook existed like i don't know where my mind would be like i, I get goosebumps thinking about it because it's, right. it's 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 incredible and then you 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 see that first of all that generational change that i actually believe is like every five years when one like wow. it, i have my my niece she's 10 like five years from now she's like She's a productive human. Uh, and what right. I'm thinking is uh, that's what's happening in, in Latin America. A lot of productive humans are coming with, with, with a tech-savvy background um, that allows them to do so much more than they were to do like 10 years ago. A lot of people right. became very aware of the, the, the advantages of digitalization. And, and it, it is still um, a place where you can create pretty much any e-commerce you can think about and make some money. So uh, this, 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 the digitalization of, of Latin America uh, has gotten to uh, a critical point or mass critical point where uh, almost uh, any business would thrive uh, locally for sure. Like I can guarantee that. Um, and compete even at national levels. Uh, and, and what had happened, or, or what happened, sorry, in the past 10 years is that uh, local startups, national startups have become much more competitive towards external or, or larger startups coming from different countries. And that's why uh, you see now on Amazon trying to like get into Latin America, but Mercado Libre, which 
people thought, oh, it's dead. Now Amazon is going to you know, destroy them. It's like, no, actually, they are thriving. <laughs> and then you start looking at other examples of startups that you know, are two, three, five years old and are today getting much more funding than any startup that might be coming from the United States trying to you know, have some operations in, in Latin American countries. So I, I think that example, by the way, it really reminds me of uh, you know, Jack Ma's biography talks about the, the competition between Alibaba and eBay in China. Right. And at the end of the day, eBay comes in with a giant one hundred million dollar uh, account to spend to conquer the Chinese market. And yet you have the scrappy two million dollar funded startup out of Jack Ma's apartment or his co-founder's apartment that are saying, no, 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 we know the market. We know the people. We know the culture. And we are. And, and obviously they they came out on top uh, and so I, I can definitely understand and I think that from an outsider's perspective it also makes perfect sense to me that you know in this 10 years uh, t- 10, 10 years that happened you have this all of a sudden this this surgence of, of innovation among the youth that are coming and saying wow like there's such big market gaps between what's happening here in Latin America versus what's happening around the world especially in like you know the, the in North America that there are just so many opportunities to it's like low-hanging fruit that you can just come and take and implement proven models maybe you have to do some cultural shifts but but proven models in consumer consumer behavior that could potentially work. Absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's part of the, uh, that, that's how an ecosystem works. Uh, I think at the very beginning of the process, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs were thinking of how am I the next uh, Elon Musk? How am I the right. next Jeff Bezos? And it's like, no, you, you can't be. Like, and th- th- there's no next. Like, you are the next you. Uh, and, and a lot of entrepreneurs have come to terms with that. And, and before, I remember there was a lot of conversation about, like, the copycats. Oh, it's so bad to be a copycat. It's like, well, it depends what you are up to do, right? It, it's it's right. not a bad thing or a good thing. It, 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 it's dependent on your purpose in life. And a lot of the entrepreneurs, I think, today are thinking more on what it is that, that they are looking for in life. What is the impact that they are trying to uh, achieve in the world? Uh, and then just try to align that Ikigai. And, and, and everyone talks about it, Ikigai, and then you start seeing this. Uh, it, purpose is, is a very powerful force. And, right. and I think the entrepreneurs in, in Latin America started realizing that uh, stop romanticizing business. Like the moment you stop romanticizing business, you really start thinking about, okay, are we making money? Why are we not making money? Fine. End that conversation. Why are we doing this? Is this important to me? Is this important to society? If it's not, then like, then do it for the money. Fine. Like it's okay. And I tell that to like local entrepreneurs here all the time, all the time, because they're like, oh, I just want to make money very quickly. I'm like, okay, entrepreneurship is not the place to make money very quickly. Uh, right. But <laughs> sell sell alcohol. <laughs> Open a bar. Everyone wants to drink, so you you'll have cash flow and you'll be fine if that's what you want to do. But then a few years from now, you'll feel empty and you'll think, why am I empty? And it's like the reason why you're empty is because it's not about the money. Whether you get like $100 million in funding today or you don't get a single dime and you are in this process of entrepreneurship, what you will realize is that that is not the center of the conversation. And the moment you open yourself up to that reality is the moment when you become free. And when you are free, uh, there is just a flow of creativity, of a passion, of energy, of respect. Uh, um, that allows you to not only convince yourself of your of purpose, but also convince others of your purpose. And when you do that, you are creating a company. That is the ultimate uh, objective. Eddie, I just love that. What is the impact that you want to make as an entrepreneur yourself? What, what, how do you answer that difficult question of what type of impact you want to have on the world? I, I think every entrepreneur is very ambitious and, and dreams of, of things that they could help achieve or achieve by themselves. Um, I hope to be able to build a legacy that is long lasting, that allows for society to thrive and that pursues above all things the success of life and, and and I'm very particular with that because we are just a life form and, right. and I think uh, understanding life has become a, a passion of mine uh, and of course plants uh, and, and vegetables and fruits and animals are, are attract me a lot um, so I'm hoping that I can gain a much better understanding 
in, in uh, I hope in the next five years on on how how for example we can create a much more sustainable world so so above all else uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the legacy that is left behind whether it's in gastronomy or it, I don't know whatever it is I, I, I don't know the future but whatever it is and I'm working on several things right now but whatever that that is that that legacy uh, really is long lasting and and that as a society we can say it, that, that that was worth spending some time on <laughs> uh, and that I can agree with that uh, um, if society doesn't agree with that today or in the next 10 years well maybe that that could be possible but but at least to me that has to be true and I'm hoping is is, is, is a legacy that can be long lasting Eddie that was inspiring thank you so much for being so generous with your time 20 minutes flies by especially <laughs> when we're having fun so it, it's unbelievable that it's already over but before we leave I have to ask you for the most important question which is three words that you would use to describe yourself um, the three words that would describe me today um, would be genuine romantic and calm I love that I love that thank you so much Eddie stay safe stay healthy this was just wonderful thank you thank you Michael have a great day